Wow, where do we start with this one that we just wrapped up with Lightweight Dave? All about Rifle Scopes Volume 1. We've realized we're probably going to have to do it in more than one episode, so we're going to rely on some of your feedback from this one to tell us more. But in this one, we talk about, oh uh, gosh, optical system designs. We talk about focal lengths and points and reticles and turrets, turrets mounting, rings. Uh, there's so much to rifle scopes. I think we were a little bit ambitious titling this one all about rifle scopes because it's impossible. We would have been here for hours. Yeah, we would have been here for hours. In fact, actually, now that David's gone, I, I thought I knew everything, and then now Dave's gone, and I actually realized I just only thought I knew it because he was explaining it really well. I nodded a lot. Just listen to the podcast, and uh, it'll all make sense. And like we said, let us know what you want to hear in volume two because we're going to talk more all about rifle scopes. What's up, everybody? We have the man affectionately known around here as Lightweight Dave. Did you know we actually no we call you that? We call you Lightweight, Lightweight Dave. Dave. Okay. Um, when well, when you're not well, around. We, well, we do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have him joining us here today. Uh, this is Jimmy on the mic and Mark to my left. And we've done a couple of these podcasts. We did all about binoculars with Mike McDowell. We did all about rangefinders with Rob and Paul. Uh, now Dave is joining us to attempt to do all about rifle scopes, and we're going to see how this one goes because this is a bit of opening up Pandora's box. There is a lot going on. Um, as you know, with binoculars and with rangefinders, sort of, you know, when we talk with Mike about binoculars, for example, I mean, you just got binoculars as a binocular, right? I mean, you, you have entry-level ones and you have really nice ones, and the difference in features and all that stuff isn't a whole lot as you move your way up. You know, maybe a locking diopter here and there, a uh, Abbey Koenig prism or whatever. Uh, but when it comes to rifle scopes, they come in about a bazillion different shapes and sizes, configurations, different kinds of turrets, different, you know, illumination, first focal plane, second focal planes, this, that, the other thing. So we're going to attempt to kind of break it down hopefully for somebody who maybe is just entering into the market of rifle scopes, or if you've been around rifle scopes for a while too, but you're just kind of curious about what makes them tick uh, and what all goes actually into this. So Dave, you've been working in product development and in and around it uh, for quite some time here. You've, you've had your hand in a number of different rifle scope projects. Mm -hmm. um, so figured you would be an excellent person to talk to about this. I feel like to start, why, and the answer is probably is probably kind of obvious, but maybe not. Why do we have so many different kinds of rifle scopes? Like, why can't there just be one super rifle scope that just does everything? Um, yeah, or I mean, are you guys working on that? Yeah, one or right does that? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, um, you know, I think probably some people would think that you know you could develop something like that in the future, but obviously, cost is you know, going to be an issue there. Um, so that's one of the factors why you have so many different ones is cost. Um, uh, there's different applications. Um, you know, I think of in anything, engineers will talk about, um, like a rubber sheet a lot of times. Okay. And it's like when you start designing, you're, you're like pulling that rubber sheet in one direction. And oh. so it's stretching in one direction, but it's getting narrower in another. And it's basically just a visual way of saying, you know, you're, you're always having to compromise something, you know? And so if, if you're going to add more features, price is going to go up. If you're going to increase optic performance, price is probably going to go up. If, you know, there's always give and take all over the place. And so um, you end up really trying to design something that's for the niche that it's meant for. And there's just so many different types of shooting and hunting out there that you just, that's why you have all the different platforms. Yeah. So. And I don't know if, you know, we'll see how this goes along. It almost might be a bit of a checklist or things like, you know, something like that. But, and obviously you have, I listed off a couple of them already, but I'm even thinking of more now, different objective sizes. You have different tube diameters. You have different um, styles of diopters and different ways of mounting them too. Um, different click values. Different click values, yeah, just mm -hmm. in the turrets and stuff like that, parallax adjustments. Um, if you stripped everything down to its base, and we were just talking about making making the rifle scope where if you asked somebody to draw a rifle scope in five seconds, they'd draw just a general rifle scope shape. If you were just to boil it all down, what what's going on in the base rifle scope 
And then from there, I suppose we can talk about the different things that you, you sort of add on as you continue getting more and more complex. What, what do you have at its absolute base? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the optical train and a reticle, basically. I mean, the mm-hmm. optical train is going to magnify an image, and then you've got the reticle um, inside that shows you where you're aiming, basically, or can be used for ranging or other, other types of things like that. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's the core of it, basically. I mean, the, without the lenses, that's, that's everything. So Yeah, and a lot of people, the most obvious lenses that you see is the objective lens, which is the end away from your eye, furthest from your eye, and then the um, eyepiece, which is aptly named, it's near your eye, uh, lens. And, and that's just two lenses of many, and sometimes you can have mm-hmm. tons of lenses in the system. What, what is the actual, if you were to take a cross-section, like what does the inside of this actually look like? What's going on in there? Um, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, you, you might have anywhere from maybe... Um, on average, like 12, 13, 14 lenses, um, in a rifle scope, you know, sometimes maybe less or more depending on, on what, what's going on. But yeah, I mean, it's not going to be two lenses, like one on the objective one, the eyepiece, <laughs> and that's it. You know, there's, there's a lot of other lenses going on in there, um, in just about any scope. So, and they're all in what we call an erector unit, right? So, well, there's more than just even in the erector unit too. Okay. So, you know, like in an objective, you might have at least two, if not three, um, just in the very front part of the objective, a lot of times, like if you have an adjustable parallax, you might have one or two more in front of the reticle. So that's five total just in front of the reticle. Jeez, we're not um, even in the turrets yet. Yeah, and you know, like, and I'm thinking of a first focal plane reticle, and I'm talking here, which is generally, uh, you know, right about underneath the turrets, and um, then the uh, reticle itself. A lot of times, it's a glass reticle is is technically a lens. Yeah, and then you got your erector unit, and you might have, um, you know five or six or seven lenses just in the erector unit. Um, you know, there's going to be four, probably at least four on, on a typical system that are, that are moving when you're um, dialing your magnification. Um, and when I say four, that would be two doublets. So it's two lenses cemented together that are moving in tandem and then another set of two lenses cemented together that are moving in tandem. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it would, it would look like it's just two lenses moving together, but they're at technically maybe two cemented together um, in each... Um, in each part of that erector tube. So, yeah, and then you've got an eyepiece, which could be three or four lenses, and there might be a couple of other lenses in front of that eyepiece, too. So, um, Wow. Yeah when, you, yeah, when you peel it back, you realize that when you pick up, when you pick up a scope, you're, you're dealing with quite, quite a complex piece of engineering. And, of course, the thing is, and, and this is something back when we discussed the, uh, the AMG story with Sam, uh, oddly enough, you know, if you're watching on the video right now and you see Dave, you can also imagine what Sam looks like because they're twins. But um, <laughs> so we were discussing with Sam sort of the process of an optical engineer going through des- the design of making one of these optical systems, you know, and 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 sticking to the optics side of things. Now, you know, you discuss when you get more expensive rifle scopes and into the higher end stuff, the optics get better, and that's. That's something that's really hard to explain because I feel like you can you can pretty much only go up to an optical engineer. An optical engineer could probably explain to another optical engineer, well, it got better because of blah, 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 blah. And they'd, you know, maybe say a bunch of math and science and physics things to one another, and then they would understand, oh, I can see that it's gotten better. Uh, or, really boring, sucky things. Yeah, really boring, <laughs> exactly. Or if you actually go in to a store and you look through optics, it's not always the greatest to do actually in a store because a lot of times they're perfectly well lit under fluorescent lighting and things aren't that far away and you're looking at highly contrasted images and whatnot. But if you actually end up using different optics at different quality points, then you can see sort of all the boring maths and things like that that the optical engineers were talking about. But if you're kind of in between and you don't have it all at your fingertips and you're not an optical engineer, when somebody just says, it got better, it's kind of... Just Somewhat ambiguous. ambiguous, yeah, yeah. What what actually is, I guess, Dave happening when it it just gets better? Is it people hear about coatings? They hear about um, lenses. They sometimes hear things like uh, certain brands of lenses, or they hear, I mean, just you know, some of these things get thrown out there as people are yeah. trying to grasp for something like, oh, this must be the secret ticket to what makes right. it better. Yeah, I mean, there's actually a lot of misconceptions out there, a, a ton, um, to be quite honest. Um, you know, and the first thing I'd start off with is that everybody's different. So what, what a person might be looking for 
um, you know, is different than what an, another person is looking for. And that can, and so one person might perceive something as better because they're just in tune for a certain thing. So, um, mm-hmm. I'll give you an analogy. I actually lost a, a really nice knife, um, <laughs> this lat or a couple weekends ago. And, um, I was, with my kids in the car and, um, I heard something fall out on the ground when I opened the door to get them out to go in in to get some food. And, um, I thought it was a sippy cup, right? So Mm -hmm. I was looking around on the ground for this thing that I heard fall. And I was, my brain was expecting to see a sippy cup. I didn't see a sippy cup because it's not, that's not what fell on the ground. It was my knife. And so I didn't see my knife. And so we went to the store and left later and I figured out later that's exactly what happened and how I lost it. And so, it that that's kind of an analogy like what you're looking for is is going to also play into what you see is better or not so so mm-hmm. if you're in tune with field of view i really want field of view you might see one scope being nicer than another but you might be a different guy and the way your eyes are or your brain is or what you're perceiving and looking for might be something different and so you might think that that scope that another guy thought looked really good doesn't look very good um, because Mm. something else is what you're looking for. And until you start getting trained on all the different things that you're looking for, um, sometimes you don't realize, um, you know, something that might be there. Like chromatic aberration is a great one. Um, You can ruin a lot of people with chromatic aberration because some people just don't even know it's there. Oh, yeah. And I I was one of those people. Yeah. And then you see it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. But before you saw it and you get mad, the person who told you about it, you're like, I wish you never told me because now I can't stop seeing it. (laughs) And I thought this image was great until you told me about it. And that's a perfect example. It's like, you weren't. You didn't know to look for the, for for a knife, so you never saw the knife. You never saw the CA because you didn't know to look for the CA. Mm-hmm. And now that you know to look for it, you can't stop seeing it. And so, it just depends on the person. Um, I think some people, and it's a combination of two things. Some people are like, well, to my eyes, and they think it's more of a physical thing. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily all a physical thing, like the way the image transmits to your eye. I think that mm-hmm. could be a little bit of it. But I also think it's the way your brain is wired and what it's looking for, just like that perception of CA or looking for the sippy cup versus the knife. Yeah. Like, and so could a person be like looking through a scope that maybe maybe it does have a really wide field of view, right? And yep. they're like, oh man, this scope is so clear. Mm-hmm. And then another person looks through that scope and maybe they're really in tune with just like resolution or something like that. Yeah. And so they're like, well, it's got a wide field of view, but I don't perceive it as super clear. Is that like, yeah. Anything yeah. close to like what oh, you're yeah, saying? Oh, yeah, that can happen all the time. You just get blinders on and you start looking at that one thing and you don't realize the bigger picture and all the other things going on with that system. Yeah, that can happen a lot. Another one that happens a lot is is people don't have the scope adjusted right for them. Oh. You know, that could be one. Um, yeah, that is a so. really big one, actually. Um, yeah. I mean, going into it. That's a it, huge one. That, that actually is. I mean, because a lot of times people, when you, look at, when you look at a rifle scope and you look at setting it up on your rifle, um, a lot of people go into it fairly intimidated by that process to do it themselves, for example, because they understand they're dealing with a precision instrument that they have to hopefully align with a barrel and, you know, a bullet that's flying out at a certain, you know, many thousand feet per second, and they're trying to hit one pinpoint 100, 200, 1,000 yards away. So, you know, they don't want to go and try and do that themselves, so they send it off to somebody else or they drop it off with somebody else, and that person mounts it for them. And that person may mount it perfect for them. Heck, that person might even just look for physical landmarks on the rifle scope, like, ah, well, I mount all my rifle scopes up with the magnification ring, even with a charging handle or even with the bolt handle. Mm-hmm. And that that ought to do, you know. And if you get get the lowest possible rings that you can possibly get, and then next thing you know, you give it to somebody with a really tall cheekbone or whatever, and, you know, they're super, they can't get behind the rifle scope well, and you know, and, and that's frustrating. And, it, you know, they keep getting it. It kind of winks out on them where the black comes into because you know, they're not uh, right in line with where right. that image is coming out. Um, that is that's also pretty huge. It's a good yeah. point. No, definitely. And, you know, you like, talk about knowing your rifle scope and the features of your rifle scope. I've got kind of a funny story. I knew a guy. He was hunting coos deer and he had to take a longer shot at a deer. And uh, and I think, I can't remember, I think the parallax might have gone out to like 500 yards or something like on, it was a side parallax. And he yeah. goes, man, I don't know what you guys did, but I dialed I dialed that knob to 500 and let it rip, got him. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm glad you got the deer, <laughs> but that's not what that does. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard that one a time or two as well. Although I don't think when Tons I heard it, people they got don't it. know what parallax does. Tons it's true. Well, can we talk about that feature real quick? Not necessarily yeah. parallax in itself, but it can be in two different places on the rifle scope. And actually, from an engineering standpoint, 
Yeah. I don't know how a, a side parallax and, a, and a, a parallax adjustment on the bell of the optic can possibly be doing the same thing. Let's, yeah. Let's dive in. Maybe I'm, I'm sorry. I'm probably, I'm jumping the gun here, but while we were talking about it. Yeah, they it, can. No, I mean, it works because I think, well, parallax is huge. In, 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 in any case, at any rate, parallax can affect the whole scope. You know. So typically you'll see a adjustable objective on a lower cost scope. And so they do the same thing. They just do it in a little bit different way. And so all you're doing is, you know, when you have a set of lenses, um, the first, well, the first thing to explain would be what a focal system is versus an A focal system. Yes. And so okay. a focal Sounds system would be like um, a DSLR camera, the image on the sensor. That's a focal system. So those oh. lenses that you'd put on a DSLR camera are a focal system, and they're they're like taking all that image and they're focusing it down to a point. All the light that's being yep. gathered by all the lenses and moving through their system, yep. and it just sends it right down onto the sensor. Sensor shows you what it's seeing. Right, but a focal is actually where. Um, and I'm going to try to keep this not too technical, but you have a bunch of the rays actually coming out parallel is what you want. So they're not actually coming down and converging to a point. They're coming out parallel. Oh, and that's yeah, yeah. because your eye does the rest of it. Does the last and it part turns of it. it and it focuses it down to a point on your retina. So your retina is the sensor, like in a DSLR camera, only that it's curved rather than flat. Um, and so you want it to come out a focal at the back of the scope so mm-hmm. that your eye can do the focus and, and turn it into a focal system on your retina. The scope is like, it's like the point guard with the assist, and then your eye is like Shaquille yeah. O'Neal with the dunk of the retina. Okay, yep. See, now it, I get so it. it. takes it to the hole. Now, on a first focal plane <laughs> system, um, you have a reticle on, on, the, on the first focal plane that's generally around where the turrets are at. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, so it's the first focal point. It, it actually, when you yep. actually read it out, it makes sense because the first focal point after all yep. these objective lenses is So right that's actually there. a focal system up into that first focal plane. So oh, like okay. the, the, the objective part of the rifle scope is actually a focal system, not an oh. afocal system. Wow. And so what's happening is you can imagine that you're creating this plane of, of an image that's a bunch of focused points, right? Mm-hmm. And so what happens is, is that there's objects at different distances. So say you had a deer at 100 yards, you had another deer at 500 yards, and so on and so forth. Well, you can imagine if you were to pick any single point off of that deer at 100 yards, you know, there's going to be rays coming off of it in infinite directions, right? Okay, yeah. And some of those rays are going to go through the scope. And so imagine like a point at 100 yards, it's going to diverge a certain amount. So there's going to be a certain angle. Like if you hit the top of the objective lens and the bottom of the objective lens, and now you take a point off of the deer that's at 500 or 1,000 yards, that angle is going to be much smaller, right? Because it's going a much further distance. Okay, So now when those rays are going through the objective lens, where they come down to a focal point is not at the same place. So the point at 100 yards versus the point at 500 versus the point at 1,000, they're not going to be focused in the same place front to back in the scope. Oh, holy crap. It actually okay. makes sense. So when you when you turn it that does. adjustable objective, <laughs> I it's literally just translating this. those lenses forward and back, um, and all it's doing is moving those points forward and back. So it's just... So at any given time, something's in focus on the focal plane. It just might not be the thing that's at the distance you want to shoot. Yeah. So that's why okay. you adjust the parallax. Okay. So, you know, if you put it to 500, that's, that's going to help that point at 500 yards come to focus on the same plane as the reticle, yeah. right? So it's not focusing in front of the reticle or behind the reticle. It's focusing on the reticle. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of like if you ever take your thumb and you put your thumb up over something like a house in the distance, it's like a mile away. You can cover up the whole house and you can't see it. But if you like look around your thumb, then you can see the house. Yeah. But if the thumb was like right on your eyeball, you couldn't look around it, right? There'd be no way because it's, yeah. it's right on your okay. eyeball. Or if and the thumb so, was like way out on top of the house. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't covered, of course. True. So, um, so it's the same thing with parallax is like when your head moves slightly side to side, if the object um, is at is not on the same plane as the reticle, then when you move your head, the object will move in relation to your reticle. Mm-hmm. And if you okay. can imagine if that's happening, it might be hard to actually hit it because now your reticle is moving in relation to the object, right? And just from your head movement side to side. Yeah. So you dial your parallax to put the focal focus of the image on the same plane as the reticle. So now, no matter where your head's at, the reticle and the image are slaved together, and yeah. and that's what you're doing. And now that's in a first focal plane reticle. That's right? f- How does it work it, in a second focal plane? Reticle? It, it it does the same thing. It's oh, just it translating the focus 
um, the focus point, basically. Okay. Um, and so what, in, a, in a side focus, you're doing the same thing, but you're typically not translating the uh, lenses at the furthest point in, in the forward of the objective. Um, you typically would have another set of lenses, and it's literally just translating those lenses fore and aft to move the plane of focus fore and aft. Hmm. That's okay. all it's doing. It's really okay. simple. Okay. So would you say in, in a scope with a side parallax, it actually does maybe have an additional or additional lenses than yep, typically would, it will. one with an adjustable objective, but it's doing the same yeah. uh, end task. Yep. And lenses are by far the most expensive component of a rifle scope, by far. I mean, it, yeah. it is like the heart and soul of a rifle scope. And so, yeah, you add, a, you add one or two lenses there, that's going to add a lot of cost. And then it just... Um, mechanics wise and assembly wise it's a lot more expensive and more parts to make a side parallax work so mm -hmm. that's why they typically are more expensive yeah for okay. a side parallax versus okay. an objective i'm kind of intrigued like what is how are lenses made are they like stamped do they get like ground down with a you know with like a guy with a flap disc or something or i mean do they how does <laughs> no, it it's a good question they're made a lot of different ways i mean there's some lenses that are molded typically not in our industry you don't see that a whole lot but uh -huh. um you can um you can get lenses that are molded sometimes they'll be molded and they'll be um you know polished afterwards after they're molded to really fine tune them in um but f most lenses that you're going to see in rifle scopes binoculars spotting scopes that kind of thing are ground um polished and coated and they start from just like a basically a blank is what it's called and so that they'll actually melt them into a blank and there's a lot of companies do that do that and this actually goes into one of the one of the real giant misconceptions that are out there so people will say well do you have shot glass in your that's one I we hear all the time do you have shot glass in your rifle scope mm -hmm. well shots a really good company but they just make glass blanks that's what they do they make glass blanks. They make different glass, but they don't make a finished. They don't make a finished glass that you can put in a rifle scope. Oh. So they'll typically make a glass blank. They'll send it to. They can send it to probably hundreds of thousands of grinders across the world, and then that grinder would grind, polish, and coat it to the um, to the specification that's needed for the scope. So they're going to grind it first. It's almost going to be like a opaque ho hockey puck. You yeah. know, just really generic. And, and 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 the grinder will grind it down um, to get it to the, the rough shape, and then they'll polish it in to get it to the more perfected shape. And then, you know, you put a coating on it. And so um, that's where it really becomes a lens. And, and, and really designing a good system, having a good grinding, polishing, and coating techniques um, will really um, help a scope come out to be a good scope. It's not really shot versus Hoya or Hara or any of that. And in fact, a lot of times when you're making an optical specification, you'll have, you know, like I said, maybe say you have 13 lenses in a scope, you might say, okay, this lens is this glass type via the shot um, library. And then every, each company gives the same glass a different name, but it's literally the same thing. And okay. so they'll, and then you'll say, or equivalent, which means that, hey, if you go oh, to the right, Ohara right. catalog or the Hoya catalog, you can you choose the equivalent glass and and it's literally just a like it's chemistry it's a chemical composition of okay. what that lens is and and you know i mean other than they do make some specialty glasses sometimes that only a certain company will make but you're talking like satellite systems that are millions of dollars you're not talking rifle scopes oh, typically wow. okay. for something like that so the all the big glass companies that are out there there's about f three or four of them that are really well known and big um you know shot um, Ohara, Hoya, CDGM are, are like the big ones. And they all know what all the formulas are and they can all make the same glass types. And so, interesting. um, you can get them from, I mean, with, with a little bit of exception there, but pretty much you can get them from anywhere and, and it's the same thing. Yeah. And so, um, and, and they're all, they're all quality companies. They make really good products. Um, so people get really hung up on that, like, oh, it's shot glass, or they think that it's like this magic thing you pull off the shelf. And, and then the other misnomer is that it's all the same glass, or you'll hear ED or HD glass, like, well, can you put, like, all HD glass? What if all 13 elements were HD glass? Yeah, I was just, um, it, you were you almost know? alluding to the fact that actually each lens is, is like, completely different from one another. Typically basically. they are. You might find where there's a couple lenses that are the same material, but, um, yeah, you you wouldn't end up with a good system if you put all the same material. So mm -hmm. if you took, like, an HD or an ED glass and you put it across the scope, you wouldn't really end up with a system. You really need something. To, it's, it's a balancing game that yeah. you need. And so, like, a typical... 
um, a lot of times you'll hear like a, a crown and flint glass. And so there's this glass map and they'll talk about different areas of the glass map. And a lot of times you oh, need yeah. like a yin and a yang for two types to go together because okay. they do slightly different things and they complement one another to make a focus. So, you know, you're, you're trying to focus like a whole spectrum of colors, right? Yeah. And so the way that different colors bend through glass is going to be different of the same lens um, red light's going to bend differently than blue light's going to bend differently than green light, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a whole spectrum of an infinite amount between typically like, and this is getting really nerdy, but between 400 and 700 nanometers is the visible spectrum. Yeah, I, re- I. yeah I th- remember so, Sam saying something similar to that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that, you know, they'll, they'll bend at different rates through that lens. And so you can imagine that that's where chromatic aberration comes from. So in a single lens, right, red's going to bend a different rate than blue. So you'll have a focal plane for red, but blue won't be in focus at that same spot. Mm-hmm. But when you're talking you know, at the, at the finished system, you want all those colors to be focused in the same spot or yeah. at least coming through like parallel, like we talked about a focal. So, um, it's like this crazy combination of 13 lenses, all bending things in a different way so that by the very end, everything kind of comes together just the way it's supposed to come together. And you yeah. can imagine there's like probably literally billions or zillions of permutations to like make that happen. And that's why you have a computer program that helps you design it. Um, you yeah. know, and so, yeah, the, the, you'll, you'll need different types of lenses throughout that complement one another to make the whole system work. Yeah. Gosh, that's so interesting. It's, it's almost like, well, you bend blue really good. Yeah. But I need, I bend red really good. Yeah. So, but then I imagine like, well, then I'm going to put the red one here, but then you probably put them together and then that changes what the original blue light was doing. Yep. Oh yeah, you can't make one change without it affecting everything else. I'm sure. No, it's a it's a. Dominant I'm already thing. pulling yeah, my system. hair out. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I'm there's so many things I'm wondering now too. Of course, like uh, you know, you look at a scope with um, scope with a bigger field of view than another. Mm-hmm. You know, what is it that makes it a bigger field of view than the other one? Or like, is there is there like a known quantity where it's like if you do this with your optical system, then you'll get a bigger field of view. Or, well, I mean, not really. I mean, there's, I mean, you know, it's just how you design it. But um, re- probably the more beneficial thing to talk about with that is the relationships of field of view to other things and what you're affecting. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then, 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 um, you know, we'd get really get into the beeps and squeaks if we were talking. You know, just how do you get bigger <laughs> field of view? You can design it in, but typically, yes, you're gonna you're gonna compromise a lot of different things. And so, there's certain things that are interrelated just from raw physics mm-hmm. that um, dictate what's going on. And so, you know, like um, field of view is tied to eye relief. It's tied to your apparent field of view. It's tied to oh yeah, that's um, right. There's a difference between tied to your um, image height at the at the focal planes which is tied to your um, travel um, amount in a rifle scope. So, Oh, for the turrets. Yeah, for the turrets. There's all kinds of things. And tube size is related and mechanics. Size of your mechanics is all related. So, you know, if, like you, if you increase the field of view, for example, um, you know, that might affect how much travel you have in the same tube, tube size. Um, Does that mean, like, maybe your erector unit inside just got bigger so it has less room around it to move or yeah i mean it can you know like that that can happen especially for a given focal length you might have to have um you know focal length is a, a factor that's in there but yeah your image just physically gets bigger to mm-hmm. get that bigger field of view for everything else being equal right and so then yeah you've got to um capture that image if you want to actually see that bigger field of view which means your mechanics got bigger which means you have less space for travel hmm. um now there's other ways to get around that um but, you know, it would be things like shortening up your focal length a whole bunch, which, and everything's a trade-off. You do that, and there's going to be all kinds of other trade-offs that happen, um, you know, and um, yeah. so. But what it, so what it sounds like you're saying is, you know, on occasion, sometimes people will come in, they'll look at something, and they'll say, oh, it's really great. I just wish if you could just kind of like, if you could just make uh, the field of view bigger, it'd be perfect. <laughs> right. It's kind of like. Okay, so go back to the drawing board completely then at that point. You know, you're, you're yeah, almost... Yeah, I mean, not, maybe not completely back to the drawing board, but it really does, like, it's like pulling that last piece out of the Jenga puzzle in a lot of ways, and it, and it, it can be difficult to, to deal with that. Or, or it can be the kind of thing where, like, if, we're, if some of our engineers are designing something and, you're, and your marketing guys, your sales guys say, hey, just 
you know, give it like turn that field of view button up just a little bit more. <laughs> like turn that field of view dial. You know, then it's like, well, okay, I can do that, but there's some compromises. You know, and that can be frustrating to hear because you're like, well, no, I want I want both of those things. Yeah, I want it the way it was, but I just don't want my better. eye relief to get shorter. Okay, well then, do, can the eyepiece get bigger, a bigger diameter? No, the eyepiece can't get a bigger diameter either. And it's like, okay, well, can we make a shorter focal length? And then and they usually scratch their head at that one. What does that do? You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, we'll need more if you want the same optical quality we might we might need you know different types of glass it might be more expensive it might you know be harder to design yeah um those sorts of things so it's it, everything is a compromise how um, does how does that work like when when you're when you're explaining sort of the different kinds of glass and stuff like that you can go into a catalog you can find xyz chemical compositions you got an optical engineer who's going to design where those go in how they get coated how they get ground cut polish all that right. stuff right in my head, and I'm sure in, in a lot of people's heads, the, the natural thing to think is, well, all that kind of sounds like if you're doing that for, say, the Crossfire 2, great scope for an entry-level scope, comes mm-hmm. in, you know, starts at like 120 bucks, and you're doing the same thing for the Razer Gen 2, which comes in at $2,000, or an AMG at $2,500. Why don't you just kind of like do what you're doing over there on the Razors and just kind of like just do it over there on the crossfires. Like, what is it that's actually happening that's so much more expensive and costly to do for those for those razors, for example, that you yeah. can't necessarily do with the price constraints of a crossfire tube? For- I mean, it's going to be, a lot of it's going to be more lenses. It's going to be one of the things. Oh, um, straight up more lenses. Yep, there's probably, it, I can almost guarantee there's more lenses in a razor. I don't know the lens count on a crossfire off the top of my head, but there's probably more lenses in a razor. Um, also in key, and I'm going to say in key areas, there's probably more expensive types of glass. So again, like you can't just put ED or HD glass across the whole system, but a crossfire might not have that. Whereas you might have uh, that in key areas of, um, you know, scope like this. It also might be a much more sensitive system, which means that in order to align those lenses, they're more sensitive to their alignment, um, to get a good image. Um, and that takes a lot more time and expense in assembly and oh, aligning okay. everything just right. And then also just, I mean, other mechanical features make it more expensive too. So Sure, like a whole the bunch of, yeah. zero stop and the locking turrets yep. and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, bigger tube sizes, all yep. those things. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that add up. How about uh, how about the zoom range? So like, you know, we've you'll hear sometimes a 3X, 4X, 5X, 6X zoom mm-hmm. range. So if you look at, this is actually, I remember I'd been, we, I'd been here for a while and, you know, talking about rifle scopes with people for a long time. And all of a sudden, one day I looked at it and I thought, hey, isn't that pretty neat? Look at that. All the PSTs, they're all the lowest number is one fourth of the highest number on all of them. And I was like, baffled <laughs> by this. Because I thought all along, I thought that the numbers were just sort of pulled out of thin air, like, ah, oh, this one's kind of, this one's a four to 16 just because, and this one's a, you know, a, a six to 24 just because yeah. we picked that, you know, we thought that would be the best. But actually, there's a very specific relationship in there where it's, you know, this 3X zoom range, that would be a 3 to 9, 4 to 12, and the 4X zoom range, you're 4 to 16, 6 to 24. How does that, like, what's actually different inside that makes one have more Xs? <laughs> I mean, that that's, other than it's just a different design system, um, it's yeah. hard to, you know, without getting into really, it's not like, like almost pulling up a computer and, getting really nerdy on it but uh, i mean essentially it's just the i mean where that happens is in the erector system but it's just the design of the erector system it's not like just the the 4x has one more set of lenses in the 3x and then the 5x has one okay so it's not 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 typically no not not no it's certainly not like a linear relationship like a 3x would have you know a 4x would have one more lens than a four or a three and so on and so forth it's not like that just keep adding lenses Um, for every no no it's it's not like that at all they're typically about the same but it's going to be the design but you're also you're compromising a ton of things to get the bigger zoom ratio Mm -hmm. and you can design whatever zoom ratio you want you know i mean just and this is for i don't know if anyone out there thinks this but they might think oh you buy a 4x erector set and you just stick it in there and it's like no you design the whole thing from the ground up and you can make a 6.6325 X erector if you wanted to. You can make whatever oh. whatever multiple you wanted. Um, but, you know, it's just um, yeah, it's just all about the design. But you're compromising things when you do that. There's other things that get more difficult when you increase the zoom ratio. And so that's going to play into cost and everything else, yeah. you know, where you want to go. Um, that's another thing with the crossfire too, right? It's a, um, 
is it a three X? I believe yep, most, most of them. for the most and part. And this is a six, so that's going to play into the cost and the alignment and the types of lenses that are used. And um, it yeah, is interesting though. Over time, like I remember when I first started shooting. I mean, th- I think you know three to nines. I mean, that's just what everybody shot. Like it was like a three X zoom range was like at least it was really the only zoom range I was aware of. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. starting off, and then it seemed like all of a sudden you started seeing fours and then fives and then sixes. Yeah, um, it just seems like over time, like those bigger zoom ranges have become more popular, more demands. And so, yeah, yeah, Mark, you've been, you've been around the industry for quite some time. I mean, basically you, you basically came out of college and you were in kind of the outdoors A little hunting bit, industry, yeah. right? You've been hunting your whole life too. Mm-hmm. And, um, Dave, you've been around, uh, this stuff for a while as well. It's, it's been a little bit, um, been a little bit wacky, I'd say to see where we've gone with optics and rifle scopes, especially, Mm-hmm in a very relatively short order of time as it well, it's yeah. insane. I mean, for a very long time, the three to nine was the thing, right? It was just kind of like, you got a three to nine. It had cap turrets. It was a one inch tube. End of story. That was the scope you were getting. If you went to the store this year, it's the same scope you're getting. If you went to the store next year, same scope, yeah. you know, like so on, so on, so on. And now it's like, there's new scopes every year yeah. that are like completely new. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty crazy to see what well we've seen the zoom ratio plateau i mean yeah you know it's kind of gotten to a point where the limits have been pushed as far as they can go and there are certain things that you you can only go you know so far with that i mean you're especially on first focal plane you're radical <laughs> the disparity between the low magnification and the high magnification is so great you can't really make the radical work right you know if you have a 10 or a 20x system it would be you would probably either be not be able to see the radical at a low power and it would be super thick at the high power or vice versa, or it wouldn't work at either. Um, so there's, there, that's just one thing of many that pose challenges. And, um, so yeah, you, we find that, you know, at a certain point it kind of tapers off like how valuable increasing that zoom ratio is. Mm-hmm. Sure. So. Sure. Speaking to all those advancements, what do you think, what do you guys think are some of the biggest advancements in rifle scopes and it doesn't have to be like an actual physical feature but just something even about rifle scopes that has happened in like the last 10 years um hmm. if you had to pick one I mean, that's putting everybody on a little bit of a spot <laughs> i know but i would it, i've got question. mine all right what's we, and yours we've talked about it before throw it though. out there the rangefinder what I feel like the rangefinder. No, 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 no. Rifle scopes. Dri- I know, but it's driving all these features on the rifle scopes. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Because you're like thinking- not a rangefinder in a rifle scope, but yeah, I'm just saying yeah, like yeah. without a rangefinder, I've got no need for an exposed turret for dialing elevation. Without a rangefinder, I've got no need for a ballistic calculator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. You know, when I first started hunting, we didn't have rangefinders. Heck, even for a long time, you know, even while rangefinders existed, like you know, just cost and things like that i didn't have the money for a rangefinder, mm-hmm. so i didn't have one and then all of a sudden yeah. you get one and it just enables you to yeah take yeah. advantage of all That's these true. different optical technologies and these different features that have been developed over time yeah obviously people were shooting long range well before the laser rangefinder came out but do you think that the, the laser rangefinder just sort of made it more of a thing where yeah if you go out to the range you can see how far away that yeah, a lot le- less range uh, range estimation or measuring things to determine range um, with reticles and things like that. Mm-hmm. That's probably how you know people did it before the range finder, yeah. if you will. But speaking of reticles, those have been quite an advancement. Um, yep. All different kinds of reticles out now. Uh, it used to be, you know, the common reticle you'd see out there. I don't when, like when did glass reticles become a thing? Like laser etched glass reticles. Maybe, I don't know when they actually came on the scene but prior um, to that and they're still out now yeah uh and and maybe there's even some 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 myths out there some previous uh misconceptions about there's the wire reticle yep and now even still some scopes out today we have some in our lineup uh even have wire reticles we call it a wire reticle but, but it's it's not actually ours aren't actually yeah and i think that they used to be and there might still be some out there but ours aren't actually wire it's just sort of a slang term that we still use but it's typically like a uh, a large sheet of foil metal and they're like photo etched out of that metal and, and just to create that shape. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's just put in the field of view. And it just obviously blocks light and creates the shape of the reticle. Um, but as you can imagine, when you're doing something like that, you know, it's a 
you can't do any kind of like floating dots or any floating features because something has to hold those features up, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a foil of metal that's got to be all connected and held in space. Yeah. Usually the elements can't extend too far off of the stadia because then right. it, it doesn't have enough support and stuff yep. like that. Yeah. But yep. then you have now like a lot of these glass edge reticles yeah. that are coming out where then you can, it's, it's, you know, you have illuminated reticles with the glass etch stuff, and they have these crazy, mm-hmm. this like filament stuff in there, or something like that, that that illuminates red. Some parts are black, some parts are red. Yep. Yeah. So they just put they just put a pattern on the glass, basically, and they and they do that in two different ways. And and so one of the ways is putting chrome on surface, and so it's a same way that they do coatings on lenses. Instead of just coating like a magnesium fluoride or you know some other kind of um, anti-reflective coating, they're just using chrome. And so wherever they put that chrome on the surface, that's where you're going to see black. It's, it's like, hmm. um, you know, so you've got a piece of glass. So now obviously you can put the black wherever you want. It can have floating features. That's going to be black. And then for the illuminated features, what they do is um, they actually, instead of depositing the chrome, they actually etch the glass away. So there's like a microscopic little um, trough, if you will, in the, gla- in the glass. Mm-hmm. And then they put, um, uh, usually it's a titanium dioxide powder. It's basically just think of it as like tiny little granules of highly reflective, um, you know, like cubes or something or particles. And so they put that down in the trough of um, the reticle and it also blocks light. So it looks black. Um, until you turn an LED on, and the LED reflects off of those little reflective granules, okay, and that's how you get an illuminated reticle, and so, um, or certain illuminated features, if you will. Yeah. So on an illuminated reticle, you typically see some that stay black and some that stay red, and so the black stuff is just chrome on surface, and the illuminated stuff is a titanium dioxide powder that's in the trough of the glass. And then, mm. how are you getting the the chrome and the titanium dioxide to actually just stay in the trough? Are you putting a coating over that to hold it in then? Um, you can, and sometimes that's how it'll be done, but you know, a lot of times you'll, you'll cement another um, oh, okay. glass, piece of glass over the top of it. The chrome will typically stay on there a little bit easier because it's, you know, it's actually adhering to the glass uh, okay. a little bit tighter like when it's vapor deposited on there. But yeah, I mean, typically the sandwich another plate okay. of glass over top. And that's that's the way to do it. That makes sense. Next up, Vortex spinner reticles with all that chrome. Yeah, people are going to start asking for some like twenty foes. <laughs> Count me in. Yeah, can I get one of them twenty foe reticles <laughs> with the spinners? Might have to um, lower my scope. Yeah, or put your scope on some little rings that make it like like oh, hydraulic rings. There you go. Um, that'd be pretty sweet. How, going into like the when you when when the development process of a reticle happens, mm-hmm. especially some of these really technical ones. We talked with Ruben and Justin a while back on sort of technical reticles. We got into some of the Horus reticles that we have and a few of our Gen 2 razors. And then there's the EBR series that we have and, uh, you know, all kinds of different ones of our uh, Diamondback Tacticals all the mm-hmm. way up to razors again. Um, there's so many there's so many features in there. And, I mean, that's got to come down to a... That's got to be a, a point where the engineers really then have to rely on... Uh, end users as well to yep. be developing the final product. You know, an yeah. optical system, an end user can't necessarily come into an optical engineer and say, well, I suggest you go and use this element of the periodic table. But but when you actually come down to a <laughs> reticle, because that's, that's such an integral and important part of the rifle scope. Right. So how long, like how, for let's say the EBR, what are we on, we're on like an iteration now, EBR 7C, Seven. I think? Yeah, I think that's probably the latest um, generation. Um, so you're, you're, you're just wondering like development timeline. Yeah. Like how long does that take to come up? It can, it can take a while. I mean, you know, there's a lot of tooling that has to be made. I mean, it's not just something that you, that you just crank out in a day. Right. I mean, so you got to do the design, all the design elements, you have to get it just right. And one reticle won't go in another scope, you know, um, typically like I can't just take the reticle out of this PST and throw it in that razor. Right. I mean, not only will the physical size maybe not fit, but the features have to be matched to the focal length of the scope. And okay. so, and every scope is going to be different, right? Um, and it's going to be slightly different. I mean, there's a chance that two could be close enough to the same that you could, you know, they'd be the same focal length, but that would just be by pure chance. I mean, typically when you're designing, you're going to let that focal length float somewhat. Um, you know, you might, you might have some certain focal length goals for various reasons, but, um, you know, you're not going to be trying to match your whole lineup across the whole lineup, all same focal length. So we can use the same reticle. I mean, it'd be impossible to do. Oh, yeah. So, um, 
yeah, it really is matched to the scope. So that's one of the things you have to get the features exactly the right size so that they sub 10 correctly when you look through the scope. And they're um, usually like, especially these glass edge first focal plane ones, like tiny. Yeah, if they're you really picked small. One up and looked at it. It's, you almost can't even see the reticle pattern in the little piece. No, of glass. you can't. Like the th- usually, I can see the really thick lines out at the edge. Like in a lot of our reticles, you see they have the thicker bands. Yeah. But then it looks blank in the middle, um, and it's, <laughs> that's how small it is. And so, like to give you an example, um, the Razor um, AMG. I think that the the thinnest lines are are I don't know like three or four or five microns, somewhere somewhere in that range. Oh, my gosh. And so a micron, just to give you a reference point, like a human hair is about 70 or 80 microns. And so it's like, um, you know, what is that? Maybe about 20, almost 20 times smaller than a human hair um, yeah. is, is what those lines are. So they're really, really tiny. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can see why you wouldn't be able to see them. Um, so, yeah, they're really small. That's what makes them hard to make and expensive. Um the glass edge reticles, um, especially. So yeah, you got to design it. You got to go through the whole tooling process. You actually have to make the tooling. Um, then you have to do prototype runs. You got to get them in house, install them in the scope, check them there. We'll check them outside the scope a lot of times to make sure that they are sized correctly and that the tooling was made correctly and everything else was, was designed correctly there as well before we actually go into production. So there's a lot of verification Mm -hmm. that has to happen to make them right. And you can imagine that, you know, when you're trying to sub 10 and you know, on a reticle and shoot. Well, when you're talking features that are that small, it doesn't take much for the for the features to be way off in size. And so that's why we oh, go through yeah. such an amazingly rigorous process in testing that the reticle is sized appropriately. That's so true. Because so. if it's uh, I mean, if a very thin feature on the reticle, when you actually look through it, when you actually look through it, it's probably subtending to what, like 0.1 mils or something. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them, like the, the EBR seven C, I believe there's like 0.2 mil radian on the MRAD version. Um, those like thinner hash marks on the top, they're yeah. about 0.2 mils apart. So like 0.2 mils. Significant, yeah. especially at long range, 0.2 yeah. mils can can be a, a big deal. And then when you're th- saying that's like like three microns or something like that, mm-hmm. yeah, like you said, like a yeah. micron. Yeah, if you're one uh, micron off, you're you're 33.3% off, right? That's <laughs> huge. That's huge in shooting world. That's huge. But you're yeah. one micron off, and a human yeah. hair is 70 to 80 microns. But you're one micron off. So, yeah, that's we'll have time. tolerances that are crazy tight to, to make sure yeah, that we're not the, the off. Level of, the level of precision is really yeah. difficult to fathom. Yeah. How many uh, how many reticle designs do, we, do you think have hit the cutting room floor yeah. down there? Oh gosh, there's a ton. Yeah, and actually, I got I I I just realized one micron off is not 33.3. I was thinking, um, you know, like um, I was thinking more 0.1 mil radian. So just to correct that, but yeah, you can you don't have to be far off to be, yeah, to be crazy far off on, on on a reticle. So I guess on a three micron line width, yes, if you had a three micron line width and you were one micron off, it would be yeah, and it would be 33 percent off. But um, well, yeah. Dave, if you ever want to fool me, you can fool me with math. I'm going <laughs> yeah, to put you that on the table right now. Yeah. Out there I do have one more. With it. I know you had a question, but I've got a reticle question. I have another one, too. So I feel like I've seen some 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 reticle cells before, I think we call them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, they're all say about the size of a, a, a fingernail, like the whole. Yeah, maybe your thumb. Yeah. Your, your thumb your fingernail. Thumb yep, like something a, like, like that. a penny or something. Yep. Now, when I look through the rifle scope, I guess that's obviously whether you're in a first or second focal plane, mm-hmm. you know, that's being magnified. But, like, I guess if you, all things being equal, if you had, let's say, a, a 6 to 24 second focal plane optical system and a 6 to 24 first focal plane optical system, yes. system yes. I should say, is the is that reticle cell the same size in both of them? It's just in a different no, place? No, it's that or not, and that's a good question. Um, and it also feeds into the expense um, of a rifle scope, first focal plane versus second focal plane. So first focal plane is going to be much smaller, typically, all else being equal, like you said, okay. um, than a second focal plane. Um, and so that's going to obviously drive a ton of expense. And it's going to be quite a, a significant difference. Is it because it's just a more difficult, more precise thing that you're working with, and therefore there's um, more expense that It has to do with goes? the optical math. And, and you okay. know, I mean, um, we can give out some, some ways that you figure... You know, if you figure some of this out, like one of the, I mean, there's an equation I really like to use. Um, and so if you want to figure out what one mil radian is laterally actually on the physical reticle, you can just take the focal length divided by a thousand and that gives you one mil radian. 
So um, if I had a 200 millimeter focal length scope, which might be kind of typical, divide by a thousand, that gives you 0.2. So 0.2 millimeters, and that's in millimeters, of course. So 0.2 millimeters would be one mil radian. And so um, that gives you an idea of like how small the features are. Um, it's going to be very different on, on an eyepiece, um, or sorry, on a second focal plane. Um, there's a couple ways you can calculate it. You could, you know, and obviously that's... Um, that's calibrated to a specific magnification only. Right. So at that magnification, you could figure out the focal length all the way to that second focal plane when set at that magnification. That'd be one way to do it. Um, or you could take the eyepiece focal length divided by a thousand and then multiply it by your magnification. That's another way to do it. Um, and so um, you can see you're going to get to a much bigger feature because, you know, like say a uh, say a six to twenty four second focal plane and it's optimized um, at twenty four x. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, most eyepieces are going to be very close to 50 millimeter focal length. I mean, they'll vary a little bit, but they're usually right around 50 millimeters. So 50 millimeters divided by 1,000, and that gives you what, like 0 .0, 0 0.05, and then you multiply that by 24, right? Okay. Um, so you're, it's, I'm not going to do math in public, but it's a lot. I mean, to get to <laughs> 0 0.2, it's times 4, right? Okay. It's 0 0.05 times 4 gets you to so 0 0.2, but, yeah. you know... Um, 0.05 times 24 gets you to something a whole lot bigger. And so um, you can see that that's the distance between a one mil radian object on the reticle. So the reticle is physically a lot larger. Um, so hopefully is I did it that math right. 0.12? 0.05 times 24, is it 0.12? Maybe so, yeah. But uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing. not going to do math in public. Someone can correct know, me on I the just, podcast. I'm all right but, doing math uh, in public. Yeah, um, Interesting. Okay. But yeah, that's... that's um, you know they are a lot bigger, and so obviously when you're when you're building something or when you're fabricating something, um, when you're thinking a, a much bigger feature versus a smaller feature, and you're looking at defects, right? Um, there might be defects you just can't see on a second focal plane reticle because it's not magnified enough. So what's what's acceptable on a second focal plane reticle is now mag we'll call it magnified, maybe ten times more on a first focal plane reticle. So now that defect looks really big. It looks 10 times bigger and now mm. it becomes a problem and it's, and so you might have to reject that part. And so your, your rejection rate might be higher or your process to have lower rejection might be much more stringent, which means more expense. Huh. So that's why it's more expensive. Not to mention the fact that um, it's a lot easier to assemble a second focal plane scope over a first focal plane scope. Oh, okay. Just because of where the reticle's at. Um, when the reticle's on the end of the erector tube, you know, you got to mount it on the erector tube, slide the erector tube into the back of the scope, and if everything's not perfect, you got to take it all back out again and readjust, put it back yeah. in again. Where a second focal plane, you just have to take the eyepiece off, and you're right there at the second fo focal plane reticle, and you can make an adjustment, put the eyepiece back on. So there's just a lot less assembly um, on a second focal plane scope huh. than a first focal plane. So that's where you'll see the the price jump. My last reticle question was: Are wire reticles just less? Are they? Truly, significantly less durable than glass reticles. Modern day wire. Yeah, reticles. I mean, I mean, they, I guess they would be. I mean, inside of a scope, you know, it's not a problem, um, just because no one's actually can touch it, and yeah. that's where you'd have the issue. But like when you're talking recoil, um, I would say they're they're probably about the same. Glass maybe has a little bit. I mean, I don't I don't have anything scientific to say. One yeah. way or the other, right here, but yeah, I would say glass is probably going to be a little bit stronger. Yeah, um, I mean, when you hold them in your hand, their glass is way stronger. Other than you can scratch it, but breaking it would be much harder to do. I mean, you barely touch um, a uh, you know a wire reticle, and you you might break it in your yeah. hand. Yeah, so it's a lot more delicate. I brought that up because yeah, you hear a lot of people kind of poo hoo the wire reticle, or they hear it, and they're kind of like, does that mean it's going to be like just super flimsy? But no, when it's yeah, actually in the, in the scope. scope and on yeah. a gun, it's it's, it's not. Fine. Yeah. Um, Turrets, very important. Yep. Turrets' job are not only important. Like, if you're listening right now and you're thinking, as I bring up turrets, you're like, well, this is where the long-range guys get their kicks. I'm, I'm out, whatever. Consider the fact that actually you do need your turrets just to get zeroed. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of first and foremost what the turrets are actually there for is because when you put the scope on your gun, chances are that that reticle that's floating in space, if you just put it on a target, at 100 yards, the barrel probably isn't pointed at the exact same point. Yeah. Um, so there is that work of sighting, and everybody, everybody's familiar with that if you've done a little bit of shooting. Um, so they are important there. But then, of course, as you move on and, and you do get into shooting at various distances, if you're not using like a BDC reticle or something along those lines, um, 
then you are going to be using your turrets. What? So we have cap turrets and tall turrets, mm-hmm. right? And generally speaking, I know a lot of times we don't recommend for somebody who's looking to shoot long range or do a lot of dialing a cap turret. Let's start there. Maybe right. I don't know if it's a good spot, but um, usually my reasoning is one, it's kind of a pain in the butt to have to screw off the cap every time you want to make mm-hmm. an adjustment, or if you just leave it off, then inevitably you lose it, and then it's just not a cap turret anymore. Um, but also those turrets tend to usually have a little bit less available adjustment in them versus a tall turret that's more yeah. designed for dialing. Why is that? What's happening underneath the part that you actually grab with your fingers? Yeah, What's I mean, it's on? it's so, you know, it's just a screw, basically. Um, but, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's much more than a screw. I mean, the tolerances on those things are ridiculously tight. Um, okay. Yeah. And you huh. can't have any slop in there, um, you know, where the screw's threading into. And it's basically pushing on the end, the end of the erector tube. It's just, it's just translating it, you know, up or down or left or right. And that's adjusting your... Um, you know, your point of aim of the reticle in relation to the image. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, like this is a mil radian scope. So, you know, every click is, you know, 0.1 mil radian. And so you have to figure out, well, how much translation on this screw is going to equal to 0.1 mil radian? And it has to be very precisely cut. And you can imagine that if that's off by 1%, well, guess what? When you dial, you're going to be off by 1%. Or, and that's not a lot when you're thinking about. Um, something that's threaded, um, you know, it, it, that it's super tight. And it's unbelievable. Yeah, for so, sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, that's what you're doing. You're translating a screw. Um, you know, if you're if you have a capped scope, um, it's usually meant to be shot without dialing. You just need to zero it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So actually, Set in a lot of ways, it. yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, really, tolerances aren't as important in something like that because. It doesn't really matter a whole lot if it's off by one percent or two percent or something like that, because as long as you can zero it and you and can put the reticle, yeah, zero. and it maintains that zero, then who cares if you're not dialing, right? Um, if you're dialing, that's when it matters, um, you know, from shot to shot. But yeah, if you can get it zeroed, it doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, once you start dialing for longer range and you want to, you know, and, and there is misnomers out there that oh, you know, a dialing. Some people think you can't dial a turret and it be accurate, so you always got to shoot off your reticle, and that's not true. Um, modern, we we do have ways to cut those screws super accurate, and we have mm-hmm. ways of testing that. Um, I've also seen a lot of people who try to test it in the field. We see that online and forums all the time. Yeah, we box see people test. Yeah, um, and pe- so a lot of people don't know what the box test is too. So um, yeah. <laughs> killing a lot of myths today but um (laughs) yeah um so i would caution people like it's really hard to recreate um testing your turret tracking in the field and a lot of guys think they really got it down um but we have a a lab that does it here at vortex it's super sophisticated it locks everything down so there's no movement we have very expensive sophisticated scientific optical equipment that's being used to test that um, we have ways of calibrating everything verifying every you know piece of equipment that's being used to do it so um yeah you know i would just caution people against that that's a pretty um, crazy the box test to too is just i just got to put this plug out there because some people think they have to dial to the extremes of their turrets and that's the box test that is not the box test um so um i won't go into it here but if that's what you thought the box test was Go find out what the real box test is because you will end up getting, you'll end up fooling yourself into thinking that the scope isn't tracking properly when it probably is. And that's because so, if you're gotcha. taking, if you're taking the turrets out to their very extremes, yeah, we need to consider the fact. Well, one, it's hard to say where exactly in the turrets range you're, you're yep. zeroed to, for starters, because yep. you may not be zeroed dead in the center of that team, right. Mm-hmm. right? Chances are you're probably a little bit off to the side, up, down, whatever. Yeah, your rings and your mount and your rail or whatever you're on might not be perfect. And Oh, yeah, there's it, a bunch. You're stacking so, a lot of different tolerances before yep. you actually get the scope in your rings. Yeah. Action, barrel alignment. Yep. I mean, yep. And then that. and then once you actually start dialing, I mean, generally speaking, if you can imagine that you're moving a circle inside of a circle, when you are talking about moving it in, you know, we don't have a turret... We don't have a turret at every 360, like every degree of 360 degrees around the scope, right? No. You're moving it like an etch-a-sketch, right? 
It's left, going left, right, right up, up, down. down. Yep. And so when you start cramming it against the outside of a circle, it might have a yeah. little bit of that error, right? Am I right? Yeah, I mean, the erector tube, you know, it's got the, red, like in a first focal plane scope, it's got the reticle on the end of the erector tube. and it's So it's a round tube inside of a round tube. Mm -hmm. So if you crank it all the way over, now it's touching that edge of the round tube, and you try to dial up, it's going to start moving. It's not going to go straight up. It yeah, it's got to follow kind it's of, the, follow contour the contour of the contour of the inside of the circle. Yeah. And so, yeah, like we've had that happen before. Um, and actually, some, and we do this on some scopes, and other manufacturers will do this too, where they'll actually limit the travel so that oh, you, okay. you, you can only move within a, like a square area so you can never actually have the erector tube touch the inside of the scope tube. Okay. Now, you lose, tra you lose total travel by doing that, a lot of total travel. Yeah, but, so your spec sheet doesn't look as good necessarily. Right, but you won't get to these areas where if you dial the full windage in, now I can't go any elevation without inducing some windage also. And so um, sometimes people can think that they have an issue, but they might actually be cranked way over. We've seen where there's... um. Uh, rifles that are so misaligned that in order to zero, say, in windage, you had to crank that erector tube all the way to one side, and it's just mm -hmm. rammed into the side of the scope tube, and now it can't go up or down without, you know, yeah, now following they run the out, contour. And they you run, run out of elevation. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. like, is, like, you know, if a person's, let's say, just trying to get a zero, you know, and they run out of travel up, down, left, right, yep. is that a pretty solid indicator that, you know, or an indicative of maybe some sort of other alignment issue then? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it could be. Yep, it's a really good indicator that something with their rifle it might be off or their rings might be off or, you know, all kinds of alignment mm -hmm. could be off. Um, yeah, that is an indicator. And there's things you can get to try and help with that. I mean, a lot of times, like, you know, like you can get um, candid bases or, you know, like 20 MOA base or something like that. Um, yeah, cheats so. a little elevation in the scope. Yep. There's also um, our friends over at Burris make the signature Z rings yep. right now yep. as, as of this time where you can essentially manipulate a little bit where the scope is faced in, yep. oh, inside sure. of the rings. Okay. We've yep. recommended those a time help. or two. Um, the other thing that you can see too, so turrets, um, as you mentioned, their job is to move things up, down, left, right, and, and your reticle, your point of yep. aim. Um now, a couple things that I know, actually one that I'll mention before we get into this next topic is is uh, because they're actually moving the entire erector unit inside and, and sort of moving it about a pivot point, um, they are also, they're not only moving the reticle is what I'm getting at. They're also moving some of the optical system, right? Yep. And isn't, isn't it most ideal in your most ideal optical image? Isn't that usually when the erector unit is like nice and straight? It is, yeah. So if, you're, if you have to be jammed way over to one side, chances are okay. you might have some actual optical issues, or it might even be a little bit harder to get behind the scope. Maybe yep. get a good, get like a really good image and, and eye relief and stuff because it might be a little more critical because you've got the erector kind of jammed all the way over to one. Yeah, side. Yeah, we try to design that stuff out, and you can, but you know, it, it obviously it, it takes more expertise and expense to do it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But we, you know, our engineers try to design that out of the system. Um, but yeah, you're going to typically, um, it's just like a camera lens. Like if you're familiar with cameras, they'll talk about how the edge of the field of view or even a binocular spotting scope, the edge of the field of view is not as sharp as the center. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. You're creating an image at the focal plane of the reticle. And so you might have less, um, sharp focus at the edge of that image than at the center. So when you crank the, uh, um, erector tube to look over at the edge of that image, you know, you're moving the reticle in relation to a fixed image, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so you might be looking at a more blurry part of the image, if you will. Um, but like I said, you can design some of that out. Um, mm -hmm. You can get other things like vignetting going on, which is sort of that blackening. Um, but yeah, you can design that out. And we actually will model that when we're designing systems. We'll actually model the different positions of the erector tube so that we know what's going to happen to the image when you move it into those areas. Okay. Okay. So that seems like a very smart engineering yeah. thing to do, probably. Yeah. Honestly, I probably wouldn't have thought of that, to be honest. <laughs> I was uh, going to say, putting a little forethought <laughs> into it. I like it. Yeah. Um, now, kind of going into the other thing that I was, I was wanting to get into, and this is something I'm sure it, it will probably even invoke a couple of eye rolls from folks because they hear all the time us harping on ring torque, right? Oh, yeah. And you mentioned rings and how they can affect uh, the internal travel potentially of your reticle, and so this it's it's hard to talk about rifle scopes actually with, yeah. without talking about rings because you can have the greatest rifle scope in the world and the greatest rifle in the world, but in the at the end of the day something has to connect the two to make them work together. Yep, and it's rings, and so those rings can ruin your day or they can make your day. Yep. And what are what are the big things with rings that you 
I guess, would tell somebody out there. Just talking about rings, ring torque, um, you know, sometimes like lapping rings, bases, stuff like that. <laughs> I was gonna, I was thinking of lapping. Um, please do not lap your rings, is what I would say. Now that comes from any rings at all. Well, I mean, I am not gonna say any rings, but modern day. Every ring that we carry is a really quality set of rings. Um, most of the rings out on the market by any manufacturer are, are pretty quality nowadays. There's still going to be some out there that might not be the greatest, and they might need to be lapped. But if you get a, if you get any reputable brand of rings, they're going to be good enough that you don't want to lap them. And I would re- highly recommend not to lap them. You can actually mess a lot more stuff up by lapping rings than anything else. Mm. Um, I'm picturing mines melting all over the world right now. Yeah, I mean, that statement. and it dep- and it de- does depend. There are situations where you might need to do it. Mm. I mean, there are situations. Um, but, but, you know... Yeah, the, I've seen I've seen a couple downstairs that have come in where yeah. they've had to get... I know Mr. Muckenhern has had to pull out the old lap bar a time or two. But, yeah. But he knows... He's done it to the point that he really, really understands how to properly do it. Well, yeah. and that's not something like, well, I'm mounting a scope, so here's, you know, lap the ring, step one. He's like, well, we got a special case here. We yeah, got to... Exactly. You know. Like, I'll put it this way. Unless, unless things are really messed up, and typically where you're going to see that happen is when you're not using a single-piece base... Mm-hmm. Um, and so the rings, the front ring from the back ring aren't aligned real well with each other. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's only sometimes, right? Like, a, I mean, take Defiance Actions, for example. They make some where, yeah, they have it built in, right? The front and the back, like in their ultra lightweight def, um, deviant action or whatever. Those things are going to be aligned. They make a really good action, right? Oh, right. Whereas a really cheap one, they might be a little bit misaligned. And so you might have some misalignment there. Yeah, you might need to lap for something like that. But, um, but other than that, like you're not gonna get any more precision by lapping. Like gotcha. if you get if you get the scope mounted in there and everything operates correctly, it's not gonna really like change your precision. And I think that's what guys think is like, well, I wanna be the I wanna the best shooting rifle I can, so I'm gonna lap these rings. It's like, no, you're not really you're just you're just adding work for no good reason at all. If you got a good solid single piece base, if you got a good action, um, reputable rifle, um, don't don't and just get some good rings and don't lap. Um, that's what I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as like ring torque goes, um, it does depend on the rings a little bit. It does depend on the scope a little bit. Um, you know, I mean, rings when you tighten them down, it's it's um, kind of a mechanical um, item, right? So you want to look at what the um, uh, what the manufacturer does say, um, you know, for ring torque. But you also got to look at what the scope manufacturer says too. And if they're really wild, far off from each other, then you might have to figure something out. But typically they're going to be pretty close. Um, the reason why we, we, I think we mostly promote like 18 inch pounds um, for our ring torque. Yeah, anywhere between and, 15 and 18 usually. Yeah, and I mean, that's plenty. Um, um, they're not going to, they're not going to slide. I mean, unless you're, you, they could if you're using something that's um, really, really lightweight and really heavy hitting caliber, um, you know, which we could, I could talk about heavy calibers another time. The, most of the time, people get way too big of a caliber for what they need, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, you can you can cause um, issues. I mean, it's David, a bigger is better. By yeah, the way. I know this is America. <laughs> okay, um, you can. Um, then why do you like the Winchester short mag? Because it's something. David, continue. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Snap. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean it's a precision optical instrument. So so if you crank down on it, you're potentially hurting something. And particularly, we talked about like the adjustable parallax. There's lenses that are in cells actually sliding here. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, those lenses are sliding fore and aft. They're changing the focus of the image fore and aft, right? Well, if if they tilt or move in any way, they're going to shift where the image is actually going as well. Mm. So if you crank down on the on the ring torque. Um, you might actually shift those lenses in there. Or another thing you could do is, right, they have to be really tight in that in that tube. So it, okay. people think, oh, well, you just have a really weak tube. No. the the um, They're fit so tightly in that tube, um, and it's so perfectly aligned to slide fore and aft. Because when you slide fore and aft, you don't want it also tilting or, right. like, moving, yeah, yeah, yeah. translating, you know, up in, in the in the you kind want, of the y-axis or the x-axis. Move you want it to perfectly slide along that optical axis. Yeah. And so, so the tube is almost like a guide? It really slightly. is. Slightly? Yeah. And so if you crank down with those rings, you're actually going to just pinch and bind. And, I mean, that tube can, and it's not even a permanent um, deformation. It can actually just bend like a couple of microns, and you just bend it a little bit. Now, if you took the rings off, it might just 
boom, bounce right back to where it was if you if you just went a, a little bit too heavy on the torque. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's a lot of times why you have to be careful how much you're cranking on them because you might just bind up and lock up that parallax cell from being able to even slide anymore. Yeah, And you'll see and then, that. Like, you can't turn your parallax anymore, you know, because mm-hmm. you've just bound it up. And people will think, well, that's, is that, that's a problem with my scope. It's like, no, we're trying to align things super precise. It's a precision optical instrument. Yeah, And so that's why you got to be careful how much you're cranking down on those. Gotcha. Yeah. So. If you ever get to a point in your rifle scope where you're trying to turn something that's supposed to turn and it is extraordinarily difficult, like to the point where you have to get a pipe wrench out, which we've seen... Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> put the pipe wrench. Put the yeah. pipe wrench down. Let's talk. Give take us a, a call. Take a deep breath. Yeah. Take a deep breath. We've seen we've seen parallax yeah. things just get snapped because people are trying to wrench on it. We've seen the razor one to six yep. illumination di- dial, which is locking, and a lot of people don't realize it's locking. Get yeah. snapped by a pipe wrench. We'll happily replace turrets. it for you yes, if we will. you do that. Um, and, and but just think about this: it's much faster to call us and us tell you exactly what's going on, and then you fix it at home, then you break it and have to send your scope back, and we have to send you a new one. Then you got to wait for shipping and everything else. So it makes me think of the term, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So when you're... That is a Davism. When you're you're mounting your scope and something isn't... Don't force it. It's a precision optical instrument. Give us a call. We're like one button push away from an actual human on the other end, and we have really happy people who love to talk to customers like you. So just call in. We'll help you out. And and we'll, we'll we'll get it figured out, that's Dave. I mean, that's fantastic advice. However, you have removed my first uh, order of operations when I'm having an if- <laughs> issue with anything, which is yeah, force it. Did you try forcing <laughs> it? Did you try forcing? I it? always think of that when I'm working on the car. I think of you yeah. because I'll get to a point where I can't get like a bolt in. I'm like, oh, did I try forcing it yet? Yeah. Um, oh, and I would say get a torque a torque driver too. So it's huge. And, yeah, and like okay. Nobody out there, if you aren't using a torque driver, and I've gotten away with not using it, and I'm sure lots of guys out there are like, I've never used a torque driver. Yeah, but sometimes it's sometimes it's going to come around and bite you. An and trust me, torque you don't feel bad because I am that guy too, like with all kinds of things. I've been in my shop at home before. I'm working on something, and I'm like, oh, crap. I need a tool that I don't have. And I don't want to wait to buy that tool. Heck no. Even Amazon, as fast as it is, like, <laughs> doo, 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 like two days. I got that tool on its way. Two days is too long. Like I want to, I want to put that thing together right now. But with the scope, don't do it again. That slow is smooth, mm-hmm. smooth is fast. Just get the torque driver. Yeah. Spend the money on it. Don't wreck the scope and do it right. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people too, when they put it together, sometimes they'll see like a horizontally split set of rings, like we have on the two scopes in front of us in rings. They'll see that when you actually torque it to spec, there will still be a gap between the two yep. ring halves. That is supposed to be there. Yeah. And some people think that that means that it's loose, that it could slip, so they'll want to close that gap. Mm. That that The reason that gap exists is for some tolerance, right? Yep. you you got to have a little bit of tolerance in there. And if you close it, like, torque and tightness is making the... It is, is achieved by making those ring halves closer together. Yeah. So the more you make them close together, the more they're strangling the scope mm-hmm. and and everything inside of it. Yeah. Um. But the other thing too, um, this is one I remember because I I talk to people a lot on the phone and say, now make sure you don't put Loctite on it when you use your torque wrench because Loctite will lubricate the threads and then you'll get a false torque reading. Your torque wrench may cam over at what it feels at to be 18 inch pounds, but really the screw has gone in deeper, so the rings have gone closer together. They're strangling the scope more than yeah. it would actually be if the, if the threads were dry. I told that to people all the time. Then, fast forward, I'm underneath the vehicle one time, and I was putting the subframe back in, which is an important piece. Sounds like an important part. Uh, yeah. It holds steering, suspension, engine, many important things. Kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and and I remember thinking to myself, boy, these bolts were hard to get out of here. You know what would be a good idea? So I've put, I've put a little anti-seize on these bad boys. And then when I tighten them in, you know, and then, then that way they'll be easy to get out if I have to take it out again. So I put a little anti-seize on there, and I'm, I'm bringing it up, and I'm like, well, the torque wrench says to torque these things to, you know, 100 and what odd ever inch pounds because it's so big subframe bolts, right? So I'm spinning, 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 spinning. <laughs> And it starts getting hard, and I'm kind of like, okay, here we go. I'm waiting for the torque wrench to cam over. Well, if you can imagine, we've discussed, we've seen where you'll set the torque wrench to like 18 inch pounds, and there's enough of a error that it might cam over at like 24 inch pounds, even sometimes we've seen. 
uh, you know, whatever math percentage that is, that's a pretty big percentage. Well, now imagine that percentage when we're talking about over 100 foot pounds. Yeah. So my torque wrench still hadn't cammed over. I'm going, 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 and usually I wait for the little kink, and that means I'm done. Well, instead I hear boom, this huge, like, explosion. Luckily, I was wearing my safety glasses. I'm like, I thought the car was about to fall on top of me. But instead, I pull the torque wrench away, and there is half of my bolt, and the other half is up inside the car. And so I had to call my dear friend Louie from over here at work, who's one of our facilities guys and has been working on old Triumph motorcycles and semi-trucks since he could walk, probably. <laughs> and uh, he had to come help me get a subframe bolt out of the, uh, <laughs> out of the vehicle. So I can, I can firsthand confirm that lubricated threads will cause your torque yeah, wrench to You're just reducing over. the friction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's as simple as that. So. It is. Yeah, fully so when torqued. We give fully torqued. And oh, she fully, was fully, yeah. she was fully, fully torqued. Fully tweaked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that, you got to be careful with that, with the with using that. I mean, you can do it, but yeah, you got to be really careful. Mm-hmm. Or if some people, sometimes people, and our they, ratings are without, so eighteen yeah. inch pound or eight, yeah, eighteen inch pounds right. is without any kind of uh, lubricant or um, Loctite or anything like yeah. that on it. And sometimes some people just refuse to not use it. So then it's just kind of like, well, don't set your torque wrench to the absolute max that we recommend. Yeah. Go to fifteen maybe, and then you might you might. Yeah cheat it up to 18 by the, the error. You might mm-hmm. error your way up to yeah. 18. I can say this, you know, with all the firearms that I've used, you know, mounting them the way we suggest, mm-hmm. I, I've never seen, you know, something back out. At least I Those personally have are under tension. I haven't had it happen. Unlike yeah. a lot of other screws, they're they're under tension. A lot of times, a a, um, a screw is like mounting two things together, and those two things are butted up against each other. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so when you're tightening the screw, it can it can back out because um, it's not under as much tension, right? And so vibration can cause it to back out. When you're not touching the two halves of a rifle scope, you're you have a, a significantly higher amount of tension on that screw. Mm. So right. it's a lot harder for vibration to cause it to back out. Oh, I never actually thought yeah. of that. Huh. So, yeah, you probably can get away without the Loctite. Very interesting. Um, shoot. We're we, so... I I feel like there's so many more things that can be talked <laughs> about. I want to talk all about rifle scopes, and there's yeah. lots of more things. We may need to do, like, a part two or something like that. I've got yeah, one I mean, there's, MC, like, um, MC Ryan or has, sighting. There's, oh, my gosh. Um, you could talk about... A zero uh, stops. Two zero diameters. Stops. We have three on the um, table right now. Aligning a rifle scope into the rings. There's a lot of there's a lot of misconceptions oh, about yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Eye relief. Uh, um, scope height. Oh, my gosh. Yep. Scope height. I have been... I hang out on Reddit too much, and there's too many things where I see you see, I see people all the time with pictures where I'm just wondering, what made you choose that ring height? And, you know, then they're saying that the scope isn't that good. And I'm like, well, it's because you can't ever get a consistent eye yeah. position behind it. There is a lot. And, and the screen has turned blood red uh, from MC Ryan because it turns that way, and it gets more and more <laughs> blood red the longer we go over an hour. <laughs> it's, get, uh, it's getting angry. It, it does. It, it's, it's, it rises up from the bottom, too, which is pretty late. It actually gives me anxiety. I kind of wish it didn't. It's probably good that it does no, that. I guess that's the thing only you guys can take it away. Right. Uh, what do you say, though? Maybe we save some of these. And P, as you listen to this, what we'll have you guys do is is head over to Instagram and tell us what else you want to hear all about rifle scopes because I'm pretty sure if we actually give you literally everything about rifle scopes this would be a, this would be a two and a half hour episode or longer. sounds good or longer yep or probably longer yep what do you think we'll do more all about rifle scopes at a later sounds day. good lightweight Dave thank you yeah, very much you bet uh what is your favorite rifle scope in the lineup by the way um the AMG yeah. Hard, it's hard not to say. I right? mean, it was it, you know, I I did a lot of the design work on that. Um, it's it's a cool scope, but I really like all of them. I like the Gen Two, like the PST Gen Two, the Razor Gen Two. Yeah. I mean, I I like all of them. I like the one to six Razor. Um, that's a really cool scope. There's a ton of them that I like, but the AMG is probably the the favorite. It's hard to beat. She's yep. a sweetheart. Yep. All right. Well. Everybody, like we said, let us know what else you want to hear all about Rife Sculpts. We'll do a part two later on. And, uh, yeah, with that said, happy hunting and shooting out there, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. See ya. Bye. See ya. Bye. That was a good one. Jeez <laughs> Louise. That's awesome. Oh, man, we go on and on. Right? I was thinking about, well, the things that were popping in my mind is the, at the end was boar sighting. Yeah. And I see guys like buy boar ciders and buy all this stuff. Lasers. And it's just like, 
I went to the range on Friday night before I went hunting. I know I was that guy. But I mean, I just I went Saturday. I put the scope on. At Five a.m. I'm gonna check a rifle after this yeah. uh, podcast. I put the scope on. I uh, set it all up on the table, pull the bolt out, look through the bore, line it up in the middle of the big pa- piece of paper, and then I just turn the scope until it's in the middle of the piece of paper. Yeah. As long Done. as you can keep the rifle yeah. braced and stationary. Well, and then, yeah. and then people go, but what if it's an AR-15? Detach upper, yeah. set on stable platform, pull bolt out, same thing. Yep. Yeah, and then I and then I shoot, and then all I do after that is I just use the reticle and I measure, oh. and then I just and Isn't then I just awesome? dial it in using the reticle, and it usually like it within a few shots I'm zeroed. <laughs> yeah. I still catch myself at times like I'm like okay, so that's about two inches, so I probably gotta do, and I'm like, wait a minute, nope, that's whatever, I'm way no way yeah, or yeah, whatever. Off. Point, yeah, point four, point four mils, point four mils, and it goes right there. Yeah, it's pretty slick. Funny how that works. Or like the Funny one that engineers like people, actually know what they're doing. You'll see these yeah. guys get all these levels to try and like perfectly oh, mounting, like yeah. mount their scope, like level with the world and everything. And they're like <laughs> plumb bobs and doing all this stuff. And it's like level with the vernal You don't knocks. need to do that. You just don't. I mean, I've actually done the math on it before. And it was something like if you're a degree and a half tilted, yeah. as long as your level is square with the scope, um, if the scope is tilted in relation to the bore of the rifle at a thousand yards it's 0. 0.6 inches of a miss yeah wow degree and a half off wow i so can't wait to it tell just people. doesn't it just doesn't make much of a difference i can't wait to tell people that they don't have to mount their scope such that they can barely fit a piece of paper between the objective lens and the barrel no no that is the dumbest Give themselves thing ever. a little more room everybody's like well i just got this rifle i'm just yeah. trying to see how low i can possibly get the scope to the right and it's just why yeah. And on right. fixed so stocks, can, so you I'll have to actually, shoot it like this. Well, and I yeah. guess I'd also be curious too. Like under recoil, is there potential? Like if it you does have, slap, okay. it slaps. Yep. Yeah, it will. Yeah, yeah. And on fixed stocks, I'll actually per- on purpose cant the scope about a degree and a half to the right. Clockwise. So when you shoulder it, it's yes. Yeah. So that the scope is level when I shoulder it, because you know it's going to. Oh, do you're going to you're going to break some. You're going to break like some. Like the brains. angle of right. This is your the angle right here. Yeah. It's, it's not straight up and down. You're and gonna, so the stock is going to naturally nestle like this, and the whole thing is going to go like that. I want the scope level. Yeah. You're going you're gonna to break brains when you say that next yeah. time. I can't wait. <laughs> All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.